Bueno, ahora sí, como son cinco, tres y cinco de la tarde, mientras... It's alguna... three or five in the afternoon. Some people will show in later. So I would like uh, to welcome you on behalf of Real Global. This is our first seminar of the cycle that we call Obreal Global in Focus 2021. Obreal Global is an association of universities and research centers and researchers around the world. It has chapters in India, Latin America, and South America, and the Caribbean and Central America, and also in Africa. For us, it is a pleasure to be able to share with you a session specialized in a topic that uh, we will have across the year several activities and we call them chartering the way or paving the way of South-South North cooperation. Uh, Braille Global in Focus has a website you have res registered there. We will have five or six long weeks of activities. You will be able to learn about, about all the projects we are working on. You will have some insights on the priorities of higher education, cooperation and development in Africa, Latin America and the Caribbean and India through our chapters and our partners. Obrea Global in Focus will end on April the 9th with the General Assembly of our Association, as, uh, General Assembly of our Association, and will be virtual and will be part of the World Conference of uh, Internationalization uh, in India. And we will be working with Symbiosis University uh, and all the activities will be there. You will have all the information about the assembly on our website. I invite you to visit the uh, program or the schedule for the conference of symbiosis also on our website. After that, I would like to give you some technical indications or instructions. And those are the following. First, for the panelists. Uh, the chat won't be enabled. We want you said to receive questions or feedback. For that, you should use the button of Q&A that is on the taskbar on your screen. The second instruction is to let you know that we have a simultaneous interpretation into English and into Spanish and into French. I would like to apologize for our participants that are German and Italian, and we don't have interpretation into German and into Italian, but you understand that we can have all the languages here. And I would like to apologize for that. Please set your audio in the language you would like to listen to, and you can mute the original audio or not, depending on what you prefer. For that, you need to press on the interpretation button to set up that. Also, I will give the floor to Elizabeth Colucci, who will be facilitating today's session. We will have also the opportunity to interact with you through a poll that we will be launching in due time. I would like to thank all our panelists from Europe, Latin America, Africa, and India for being here today in this launching session. I will give the floor to Elizabeth now. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Nico. Welcome everyone. A pleasure to uh, know that you're with us today. It is unfortunate that we can't actually see you, but uh, we nonetheless feel your presence and we hope that you will be sharing questions and comments and ideas in the question and answer um, box. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Colucci, uh, Projects Director at the Obriel Global Observatory. I will be assuming the role of chair today. Unfortunately, our Vice President Kieran G is unable to be with us. So I am not Kieran G, <laughs> but uh, he does send his best regards and, and best wishes for this event. Um, before I hand the floor over to Ramon Torrent, the President of Obriel Global, who will say a few more words about what Obriel 
Global in Focus is, we would like to conduct a first poll um, to get a sense of who you are and, and why you're attending this particular, this particular event today. Okay, so you should have a question appearing on your screen. And the question is, what is your main motivation to attend this webinar? I will read out the answers because some of you may not uh, read English. Uh, the first response is, I currently collaborate in South-South-North partnerships and I want to continue. The second response is, I think South-South-North collaboration is important and I want to find ways to engage in it. The third is, I do not understand what South-South-North collaboration really means, but I want to learn. And the last is, I have doubts about the feasibility of South-South-North cooperation. Please select uh, one answer, give you a few more seconds to do that. Okay, 10 more seconds. Okay, let's see what we got. So um, the majority of you responded, I think South South North collaboration is important. And I want to find ways to engage in it 45% of our participants today 31% of you uh, currently collaborate in such South South North partnerships and want to continue and 24% of you don't really understand what we're talking about but want to learn. So excellent. Now we get a sense. Um, and I'm very happy to see that nobody seems to doubt the feasibility of it. This is very promising um, for our objectives. Okay, um, I would like to now pass the floor to Ramon Torrent, who is the president of Obreal Global Observatory and in many ways the, the founder and the visionary uh, to allow him to explain a little bit more why we, why we are here today. Ramon. Thank you. Uh, Nico Patrici has already explained uh, the meaning and the purpose of Obreal Global in Focus and has already introduced Obreal. So I will be very short and I will not take the five minutes that have been allocated to, to me. Uh, I will, in fact, concentrate on two points. First, these welcoming words, if we have to be really global, should be addressed to you, at least in the six official languages of the United Nations, Spanish, French, English, Russian, Arabic, and Chinese, but also even in Portuguese and Hindi, which are very important for our activities. Uh, I can only speak but English, which is what most of us speak here, with some exceptions, acceptable French, and a bit better uh, Spanish. So I will continue in English, but for the principle, I will also pronounce some words in French and uh, in Spanish. Um, the second point I want to emphasize is that sometimes all people like me have to say some truths that other people are not able to say. And let me remind us in the opening of this of real global in focus that to my knowledge, and this is an empirical fact, the only undisputable, uncontestable biological fact is that we are human beings, members of the human species, and as a consequence, citizens of the world. Then there can be many other circumstances that uh, characterize us and has uh, framed our life. But we should never forget the biological fact. C'est pour ceci que je pense que uh, la, la coopération globale, uh, d'abord dans des différentes zones géographiques, pour ne pas se perdre, les zones géographiques dans lesquelles uh, Obreal a organisé des chapitres, des chapters mais aussi entre les chapters euh, est essentiel. Euh, est essentiel parce que sinon, nous perdons de vue ce que nous sommes. 
pas seulement ce qui nous intéresse dans la présente. Not, we are not only interested in a global, a globalized schedule, but en el sur, en los capítulos. Pero Global también, Focus promotes the dialogue between chapters, but also in the chapters in the South, South, South chapters, and also with Europe, the South, South, North, so that this is something helpful and can be repeated every year. As Nico Patrici has said, I would like to thank all of you for participating today. We hope that Obreal can be up to your expectations. Thank you very much, everybody. Goodbye, everybody. everybody. OK, thank you so much, uh, Ramon. Very hard to stop you from speaking multiple languages. I do understand. Um, we have for the program today we've essentially divided this into two parts you will have the opportunity to first listen to a, a keynote that will frame the topic and and frame the whole um purpose of obriel global in focus um, and then we will introduce the panel and from that point onward we will keep um this session very interactive. The panelists have been asked to prepare responses to questions in advance, as opposed to preparing lengthy PowerPoints. We do encourage you to leave your questions and also your comments and your ideas in the, in the question and answer box as we go. My colleague Nico will be monitoring that and on occasion will be introducing some of the questions and the comments into our discussions. Um, at this time, I would like to introduce Adrian Bonilla. Uh, Adrian, Adrian is a good friend, a uh, longtime collaborator of Obreal Global. He is currently the executive director of the EU LAC Foundation uh, based in, uh, in Hamburg in Germany. Uh, before uh, joining the EULAC Foundation, he was the National Secretary of Higher Education uh, in, in Ecuador. That was between 2018 and 2019. And he has also served as Secretary General for the entire region at the Latin American Faculty of Sciences Flasco. Um, he has an extensive uh, history in, 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 in politics in, in Ecuador and also in, in academic publication. Uh, in, in, in Latin America more broadly. Uh, he was also the vice president of the advisory board on foreign relations uh, in Ecuador uh, and has served as an international electoral uh, observer. Um, we're very pleased to have Adrian with us here today. And I should comment that Obriel Global and the EU LAC Foundation now have an MOU uh, and are working very closely together with the different um, Latin American and Caribbean chapters of the association, which uh, Ramon has referenced. So I would like to invite Adrian now to take the floor to give his, his keynote and please do uh, keep that within 20 minutes. Muchas gracias, Elizabeth. Uh, creo que van a ser... Thank you, Elizabeth. It will be less than 20 minutes. Although, thank you for your generosity. They told me I had to, I had 10 minutes, so I will try to comply with that. I want to say hello to everyone present, to those present in the webinar. I want to say hello to Ramon Torren and all the colleagues of Obreal, this important international network as it links different persons, different activities, and also societies around a specific topic. This is an organization that works closely with ULAC Foundation as they have shared goals. For those of you who do not know it, this foundation is an international body. It has been created by the different heads of states of Latin America, uh, the Caribbean and Europe 10 years ago. It is an international body and the mission is to promote 
the existence of the bi-regional organization in Latin America, the Caribbean and Europe related to the mandates, the decision decisions of the heads of state, the societies of the different countries that make up this strategic alliance, bi-regional alliance. Maybe we can start this talk by saying that we should identify the importance of the South-South-North cooperation and why do we call it like that? Why does higher education and research are so important for the dimension? Maybe we should uh, describe the South-South-North cooperation, which is important, and it is important because unlike the past conventions that are still paradigmatic in terms of some cooperation policies, this idea, the South-South-North cooperation provides a complex perspective a horizontal perspective of the relations between societies and the states. It talks about cooperation, not just about a fact that exists between governments and states, but a fact that involves and is aimed at societies. And also it is a fact that occurs in different directions. It's not just a one-way path in which those states that have resources are able to transmit them to other societies, to other countries. Cooperation flows in this world involve broader agenda and they're not limited, and this is very important, exclusively to the transfer of monetary funds. That's why we talk about South-South cooperation and North cooperation, because in a contemporary world, we cannot assume that there are societies that do not exchange things and do not feed other societies. Besides the international division of labor and transfer of resources that existed in previous centuries, South societies cooperate with the North, not only with human resources, but the transfer of knowledge to provide uh, cultural knowledge and also to balance the asymmetric um, characteristics of the international economy. We have the transfer of technologies, we have uh, cultural relations between the countries in the south and is even more comprehensive, but the impact in the knowledge in connection to the economies in the societies in the has become more important from the perspective of Latin America and the Caribbean, for example, if we look in terms of higher education and researchers at their relations, you will find that there's not a place that not in the European countries, we have more postgraduate students than in any other region, but also universities and research institutes and think tanks in Latin America and the Caribbean receive many European researchers, postgraduate students, and at the same time, there are thousands of Europeans working around all scientific issues, human sciences and other sectors as well in Latin America and the Caribbean. And this, which occurs in these regions, occurs in all societies in the North and in the South. So we also need to take into account this growing exchange due to globalization between the societies in the Global South. In order to understand the idea of cooperation, and this way of understanding the reality, we want to remind you that this South-South-North concept it does not follow logical ideas about uh, cooperation flows, which 
does, do not exist in only one direction from north to south. In the higher education sector, we have to face several challenges, challenges around common systems that in the countries that make up this relation, topics that have to do with the goals, the objectives, the sustainable development goals established by the UN, those goals, millennium goals, established several society um, several goals in the society to order the way in which public uh, policies were systematized and were implemented to create something among institutions decision makers implementing these public policies those criticizing public policy created a community of interest and a, a unique language for practices that have to do with the notion of development. These goals, current goals, sustainable goals, these objectives set by the UN are placed in as an area that were that was not taken into account when they were developed. And this will make us update these goals, analyze their temporality and the possibility for them to be achieved. For example, the processing of objectives and the sustainable development goals, these are global issues, but they have to do with knowledge, with knowledge production. It has to do with teaching, with uh, learning, these are academic issues as they are global policies and they are academic global issues. They do not belong to a particular society and they do not belong exclusively to the countries in the South or the countries in the North. They belong to the set of persons that make up this dynamic. We are talking about a global language and we are talking about a global topic regarding higher education. At the same time, we could discuss the scientific issues, social issues and political issues, economic issues that have to do with the necessity to mitigate the impact of, of uh, climate change. This is a social and global issue. This affects a global society of knowledge and it becomes a topic for education, for higher education and research. Just to mention a few examples. Now we are going through the COVID-19 pandemic, which had an impact on the economies of the different countries. And all countries are going through a global recession. This has been the most dramatic um, issue for humanity since Second World War. It has scientific consequences, economic, social consequences, and impact public policies, and which becomes in biological in the biological sector, it needs to be researched. It is related to the agenda of higher education. And we could also mention human mobility and the spread of knowledge as no society in the world is isolated. We need to take into account elements that show a globalization that affects society and the economy, not only the market. The idea of South-South cooperation takes into account this global dimension of exchange, and it includes knowledge, economy, knowledge as a social fact that is global due to the degrees of global mobility and the impact of different topics that affect in a cross-sectional way 
all societies and also it affects all governments in terms of their policies and also all sciences. In that sense, the need to bear in mind this shared cooperation agenda has to do with different capacities, um, technical capacities, the capacity to share in a creative way the different fields, the way of the idea of working across borders, the capacity to plan in scenarios that go beyond national borders, the possibility for innovation, that is to say, to apply scientific knowledge and the impact in the societies that allow that knowledge to be produced because there is a need for that knowledge. This implies and depends on the capacity that we have to access scientific data innovative technologies, the balance that mitigates the digital divide that exists nowadays, the investment that we make on research and education, the efforts to guarantee the quality of teaching, the scientific mobility programs and the existence of funds and resources for international research initiatives at a global scale in the short term and in the long term, if this situation teaches us something about the globalization we're living in, is that we should understand society made up by different nations, structures, states, as a society that is articulated not only in the market or tra economic transactions, but that is articulated in all fields and where it's not possible to understand knowledge or the production of knowledge or the spread of knowledge as a domestic or national fact. It is not possible to understand knowledge as a way, as something that created by an individual person, like in the 19th or 20th century, research cannot be understood or knowledge cannot be understood or higher education cannot be understood as a domestic national product because it becomes evident that it becomes or it is a global fact. In that sense, when overall global mentions the North, North, South, South, North Corporation, it is describing, as well as the ULAC Foundation, it is describing a concept that explains the global production of knowledge in the contemporary world. This progress needs the stimulation of rules of uh, uh, networks in the regions, by regional networks worldwide, that has to do with the capacity of Obreal Global. So I want to congratulate this event, this seminar, the initiatives the Obreal Global has, and I want to congratulate everyone working on them. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Adrian, for these inspiring and, uh, and well-contemplated uh, opening remarks. I think you've set the stage for what we uh, would like to discuss today. Um, and you've also uh, very clearly um, demonstrated that there is a need for what we are trying to do, not just with this event today, but with the whole um, Obreal Global in Focus series that uh, entails a number of different events looking at different regions and different topics and their interconnectivity. So thank you so much, Adrienne, uh, for, for these words. 
I would like to um, turn now to our panel. I would remind you colleagues that the question and answer section is at your disposal, should you have any remarks to make, specific questions for Adrienne that we can take. So please do leave your comments and questions in the Q&A uh, in the Q&A section. Um, we have um, a very uh, diverse and dynamic panel today. I would like to say a, a few words about each of our panelists and then we will go right into the questions. Um, Peter Berle is joining us today from the, um, in, uh, the Instituto Americano, Ibero-Americano of Berlin. Um, based in based in Germany, he has been a senior. He has been a lecturer and senior researcher at universities of Mainz, uh, Rostock, Düsseldorf, and Berlin, and a visiting professor at several universities in both Chile and Colombia. He has published uh, extensively on a range of, of 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 issues related to foreign policies and comparative perspectives and regional cooperation in Latin America. Uh, he has been the chairman of the German Association of Latin American Studies. Um, and he is replacing uh, ba Barbara Goebbels today, who unfortunately can't be with us. But we have a long history of collaborating with Peter and are very pleased that he could join. So you're very welcome, Peter. Thank you. Um, Marcelo Scalisi, who has been added to the program at the last moment, who complements, I think, our, our panelists, um, not just in terms of the region he represents, but also in terms of his experience in South-South-North cooperation. Uh, Marcelo is currently the director of the Mediterranean, Mediterranean Universities Union, UNIMED. Uh, he has occupied that post since 2008, and he has grown the association considerably, expanding its membership across the Mediterranean region, both on the European side and the Northern African side. Um, UNIMED uh, leads a, a number of very interesting South-South Collaborative North projects in the region, and is also a, a privileged uh, stakeholder and, and collaborate, collaborator of the European Commission when it comes to defining programs and policies of the EU towards the Mediterranean. Um, so you're very welcome, Marcelo. Thank you for joining us. Juma Shubani joins us from Burundi. Juma as well has, an, has a very dynamic background in the higher education sector, uh, trained as a, as a mathematician, uh, held a position at the Institut Physique Théorique Université uh, de the Université Catholique du Levant in Belgium. Uh, he's a, currently a professor uh, in the Department of Mathematics at the University of Burundi, but also wears several hats in the African continent. He, had, he also occupies the role of Deputy Secretary General of the Association of African Universities, the AAU, which is a strategic partner and member of Obriel Global. And Juma now is, uh, has been appointed the, the coordinator of what is called a cluster of the African Continental Strategy for Education, which is backed by the African Union. Uh, and he heads the area, the, the subcluster it's called, uh, entitled Harmonization, Quality Assurance and Accreditation. So thank you so much for being with us today, Juma. Um, we're very pleased that Vidya is with her, Dr. W that Vidya is with us today, Dr. Vidya Yaravdekar, who joins us from uh, Symbiosis International University. Uh, Vidya is the Pro-Vice-Chancellor Pro of the University and is also the Chair of the Obriel Global Chapter in India. Uh, she's the Chairperson of the FIKI Higher Education Committee. This is a very important conference in India. Uh, the, Dr. Vidya has been very influential in policy regulations for promoting um, the higher education sector innovation and internationalization in India. Uh, she's had appointments on a number of governmental bodies, including the University Grants Commission, uh, the Central Advisory Board of Education, and the Indian Council for Cultural Relations. Um, she has been a tremendous supporter and advocate of Obriel Global and has brought Obriel Global to India and, and, and in many ways has brought India to the world and will continue to do so. So you're very welcome, Vidya. Okay, we're going to start off with a round of questions to all the panelists. Um, for your first remarks, please, if you could re remain within five minutes, and I will, I will say something if it extends too long. But the first question is really for all of you. Um, how does South-South-North cooperation play out in your present work? What does it look like? 
has it gained importance in recent years? So please, a broad question, but we would like to know what South-South-North cooperation means in your countries and in your organizations. And we will start, uh, we will start with Peter, please. Thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth, Ramon, and all the others for the invitation. As you can easily see, I am definitely not Barbara Goebel. <laughs> Our director has to appear at very short notice in a federal state commission dealing with the future of our umbrella organization and so she apologizes for her absence at short notice and sends her best wishes to the entire event. I'm very honored to, uh, <coughs> to try to replace her today and uh, I would like uh, starting uh, mentioning that the Iberian American Institute is an interdisciplinary center for academic and cultural exchange between Germany, Europe and Latin America, the Caribbean, Spain and Portugal. It is home to the largest specialist library in Europe for the Ibero-American region. And it is also a place of knowledge production of exchange and uh, cultural translation. So our self-conception uh, as a platform of cooperation and catalyst for intercultural and transcultural dialogue means that uh, South-South-North cooperation is, uh, so to speak, part of the DNA of our institute. As for the importance of such collaboration and the challenges to it, I can only agree with Adrian Monilla. If we take the newer concepts of development theory seriously, we must finally stop talking about developed countries and developing countries. And by this, I do not mean that we should no longer take global and regional inequalities and asymmetries into account, but that we have to stop uh, some countries seeing themselves as a model and thinking that the others should follow this model. We have common problems and common global goals that we can only achieve if we also work together on solution strategies. One could even expand the idea of South-South-North cooperation because it is not as if the North is homogeneous. There are many differences and many needs for cooperation there as well. So in the logic of the SSN concept, one could in this respect also speak of a need for SSNN cooperation. So if I would like to give you an example of how South-South-North cooperation plays out in our present work, referring to collaboration with our visiting scholars from numerous countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. Under normal conditions, every year about 17, 70 international guest researchers from various disciplines, institutional backgrounds and career levels carry out research stays at our institutes. They are supported by the EIS grant and fellowship program by German and foreign funding agencies or by funding lines from their home institutions. The visiting scholars come mainly from Latin America and the Caribbean, but not only. Huh? So for the, these visiting scholars, the Ibero-American Institute is an internationally attractive place for pursuing research, not only because of the extensive holdings in the library and the special collections, but also because of our diverse networks. The guest researchers are included in the various activities of the institutes. Examples are our research colloquium and our monthly lecture series on knowledge production and culture transfers in transregional contexts. So in our research colloquium in particular, we repeatedly experience that not only scientists from many different disciplines meet there, but also people from many different countries. And as a result, not only South-North networks emerge from states at our institute, but also networks between people from different Latin American countries who very often met for the first time uh, researchers from other Latin American countries. But at the same time, it is important to emphasize how important visiting scholars from Latin America are to us with their expertise and their knowledge uh, these visiting scholars strengthen not only our research profile, uh, but also our international networks. And often these research stays lead to long-term collaboration that results in joint publications, events, mutual invitations and research projects. Just to give you one example, and then I'm finished already. Uh, 
a few months ago, we published a book on internationalization processes in Latin American higher education. The starting point for this book was the research stay of a colleague from the Universidad Nacional de la Matanza in Argentina. We found out that we had partly identical research interests, met repeatedly at international conferences afterwards, and finally started planning the book on which scholars from other Latin American countries, but also from the United States and from other European countries then collaborated. In turn, based on this book, we organized two virtual panel discussions last November to share ideas about the challenges for science and research that have arisen from the COVID-19 pandemic. This also involved scientists from different Latin American and European countries and such forms of experience exchange are extremely important for us. I think uh, this type of collaboration has always been important to our institute, but uh, certainly it has become more so in the past 20 years. In addition, uh, trans-regional perspectives, and this would be in the sense of South-South North uh, cooperation, uh, but I would also consider the uh, inner Latin American cooperation as a South South cooperation already. But so the transregional perspective is becoming increasingly important for us. I will leave it with this for the moment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peja. I think you raise a very interesting point. Um, some of the associations and networks represented here today have by default worked uh, in a South South North construction, for example, if you're committed to the Latin American region or to Africa, but this element of the trans-regional is perhaps something that's not as naturally uh, stimulated, stimulated, funded, or explored, uh, and I think we have a lot of uh, important opportunities at present to do so. Um, I would like to turn now to uh, Marcelo. How does this look uh, from uh, the Mediterranean region? Uh, what does South-South-North cooperation mean uh, to UNIMED? Thank you, Elizabeth. Thanks, Ramon and Nicolas, for this uh, invitation, for the opportunity to join this webinar. Um, it's a very interesting session to discuss about South-South-North cooperation and in particular looking at the Mediterranean region. First, let me briefly explain uh, the, the, the UNIMED network, because it's, for, it's the way to answer in some way to your question, first of all. UNIMED is a network of Euro-Mediterranean universities. We have more than 100 universities from 23 countries, from Southern Mediterranean countries and from Northern, from European Mediterranean countries. Uh, this is exactly South-North cooperation in some way. We belong to our members. UNIMED is an independent network. This means that our universities, our members are very used to cooperate in the region and in, in the Euro-Mediterranean uh, academic framework, uh, thanks to the European Commission programs that support uh, in different ways the Euro-Mediterranean academic cooperation. And we are used in some way to develop this uh, north-south, south-north cooperation in mobility, mobility of students, researcher, uh, academic um, staff and professor. Uh, we are used to have capacity building projects to transfer competencies from one side to another. I don't want to say that is not only from north to the south, but I think that is a vice versa process in any case. Um, and I think there is a very a long tradition of cooperation in the Mediterranean region among universities in this uh, north-south framework. Uh, but what we uh, what we miss in particular is the south-south cooperation in, in Medi among Mediterranean countries. You know, we are used to say that Mediterranean region, uh, but uh, uh, unfortunately, Mediterranean region doesn't exist. We don't have a common framework. We don't have a common uh, institution. I mean, among Southern Mediterranean countries, at least. And the European Commission, thanks to all the programs dedicated to the Euro-Mediterranean cooperation in some way, uh, contributes to develop this bilateral dimension. Uh, I mean, the European Southern Mediterranean, but on a bilateral basis. And this is, I think, that is the most important challenge for the coming year, how to in, involve 
universities from southern Mediterranean countries, first of all, to cooperate among them, uh, to identify potential opportunity uh, because they have common challenges, of course. We have, if we look at the region, common priorities, as Peter said very well, we have common problem, we have common priorities, we are obliged to cooperate among us. Uh, and I think that it's also important to invite our Southern Mediterranean universities and partners, and of course countries, to, to develop the cooperation, the South-South cooperation scheme. That unfortunately is not, until now is not there. We are trying to do something in this, and but I think that we will talk more in detail later. But I think that the most important issues at the moment is to invite and to encourage institutions and universities to identify uh, the possibility to have common projects, common initiative, or why not to establish a common framework of cooperation among Southern Mediterranean, among South Mediterranean universities. Uh, the big challenge now is to invite also Europeans to encourage this framework, because otherwise we remain in this uh, bilateral dimension that is not uh, so successful for the region in itself. Uh, look at the situation, the current situation now. Unfortunately, everything is moving online and so on. And in this situation, obviously, it's not possible to think about mobility. It's not possible to talk about common uh, uh, project research and so on. Capacity building also is very difficult to manage. But more could be done if a South-South cooperation scheme is, could be more developed. This is the reason why I think that we have to invite our universities and in particular Southern Mediterranean government to pass uh, all the obstacles that there are at political level, at academic level and among Southern Mediterranean countries and to establish common framework. First of all, on mobility, why not to have a sort of, uh, we have in Europe this Erasmus program for mobility of students why not to invite Southern Mediterranean countries to have a, an Erasmus Plus program on mobility of students among them. That is the starting point to, to recognize each other and to recognize the, the academic uh, profile of their own colleague in the region. Oh. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Marcelo. And I think you raised a couple really interesting points. I guess one question is, does the South-South uh, cooperation exist without the N, without the North? And I'm thinking in particular of instances where you have the funding coming from the North, like in the case of the European Union programs that you mentioned. Um, these programs have been incredibly productive and have had tremendous spin-off effect in stimulating greater cooperation between countries in the, in the Southern Med, for example. But, but, but is that N needed for the, for the SS, for the South-South to happen? And wouldn't it be nice if we could generate more examples of the partnership starting deliberately between the South and inviting the North? Um, and that is also why strategically we've put South-South before uh, north, when we talk about South, South, North. Um, and also your point about mobility, and I think that's another in interesting example. I know that the European Commission starts to fund mobility within regions. I can think of existing programs for Southeast Asia. Um, I can think of programs in Africa, uh, the Intra-African Mobility Fund. Um, but isn't it interesting that the funding is once again coming coming from the European Union. So that's just food for thought. Um, I would like to, to turn to Vidya now, because she said she might have to, to jump off at one moment. So we want to make sure we give, give her space. Um, how does this look uh, in, in India? And particularly, how do you relate to the topic of South-South-North collaboration at, at Symbiosis? So first of all, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to speak. And it's always a pleasure to speak at uh, Obriel platforms. Uh, and it's a very nice topic. And what I like uh, I, uh, most about the topic is it says charting the course for South, South, North cooperation and beyond. So I think this and beyond is very important for us to understand because historically we've seen that aid has always flown from the North to the South. 
And when you talk about a South-South-North cooperation, and I also like, uh, you know, uh, it's starting from South-South and then North, because otherwise people do refer to it as North-South-South. But nevertheless, this so-called triangular cooperation was earlier limited to two developing countries and one developed countries, and the developing countries really relying on a developed country for, for knowledge, for technology, and other resources. But as uh, Mr. Peter very rightly said that, uh, you know, the words developing and developed are also fading away now uh, because of the emergence of the South as uh, the hub of economic vibrancy, uh, enterprise, and a can-do spirit. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the reports of the UNDP of 2013, uh, which was titled as the rise of the, uh, of, uh, the human progress in a diverse world, uh, encapsulates this uh, very steady rise of the South. And for the first uh, time in 150 years, the combined output of the developing world's three largest economies, Brazil, China, and India, is about equal to the combined GDPs of uh, the uh, long-standing industrial powers of the North, which is obviously Canada, France, Germany, Italy, UK, and US. And developed countries have also outperformed in uh, areas like education and healthcare, and of course, infrastructure. And I think the present pandemic has also seen the emergence of a very strong healthcare uh, system in, you know, in the southern or the, uh, you know, uh, the the south south countries and their cooperation. Uh, you know, at the uh, uh, at the national level, uh, we've seen examples of such uh, cooperations. Uh, for example, the India and US signed uh, in the March of 2019. Uh, 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 an amendment which was called as a statement of guiding principles and uh, where they actually looked at a framework for promoting cooperation between not only these two countries, but between these two countries and countries in Asia and Africa and in areas of uh, you know, energy, environment, health and education. Uh, at the South-South level, we've seen at the Indian government's level, a lot of participation and collaboration, with, uh, for example, with Africa, specifically with several programs being launched, uh, like the ITEC program, like 50,000 scholarships uh, for African students, uh, and uh, you know, even holding India-Africa summits annually from uh, the year 2008. Uh, so at the South-South level, the country has done a lot. It is also finding partners for the South-South-North cooperation, not just with the US, as I said, but even with, uh, with, with European countries. India also looks at um, its soft power when it comes to such cooperations with through the Indian Council for Cultural Relations, when it looks at the cultural aspects, which is our Bollywood films, and it could be yoga, Buddhism, etc. So we do see such examples at the national level. But I personally feel that uh, at the university level, a, a large amount of such South-South-North cooperation or in general collaborations and cooperations can really happen because I think it's the academia and the whole academic world that can really provide one of the best platforms for such cooperations, whether it's through mobility of students uh, or whether it's through mobility of teachers. And as uh, Peter rightly said that even research projects, I mean, you could actually see a common through this pandemic, you can see several such research projects which really need um, Kind of global solutions and it's not just about two countries at uh, in in uh, particular zones that need to come together but i think it's the whole world needs to come together to find such solutions and i would say that at symbiosis international university we've had such exemplary examples i mean we have students from different parts of the world and i think it's all about internationalizing their minds to such global uh, you know issues and finding global solutions so whether it is students from the west from the north which would be US and, uh, and Europe and students from Africa and India, even sitting into the same classroom and discussing issues, uh, which are global issues. I think that also means a lot of cooperation of the South, uh, South, South, uh, uh, North. Uh, so I think universities do play a major role in such cooperations. Uh, at, at the Indian government level with the national education policy being recently launched, though there is, uh, there is no a single focus on such South, South, North uh, uh, cooperations, but uh, they have um, made a very strong mention of collaborations of such networks. And I think that's going to be uh, go a long way because the Indian government is now actually looking at implementing this, uh, this national education policy and through a platform called Global Outreach, 
on which I sit as a member, we have been discussing about forming a framework, uh, a common framework amongst countries, uh, specifically the South, South, North, where there can be an ease of movement of students and faculty members and researchers, uh, you know, so, uh, so as to come to a common cause of finding solutions. Uh, so therefore, I think the national education policy will certainly give an impetus for such, uh, for, for such cooperation and collaboration. And at the end, I would say that uh, uh, Obrial Global is itself a wonderful example of a network of South-South-North cooperation. I mean, some of us sitting here as members, you see, we come from different parts of the world. We have Africa, we have India, we have Europe. I mean, what more do you want for exhibiting a South-South-North cooperation? And I'll be happy to extend uh, these activities of Obrial Global. We have been doing them in India. And one such which Nicholas uh, made a, uh, a remark of in his opening remarks, Remarks, uh, is a conference uh, which is happening uh, in the first week of April from 6 to 9 on internationalization, reimagining internationalization, and we are going to discuss about blended education as a catalyst. So I think it, it's a, it will be a wonderful, uh, you know, South-South-North uh, cooperation, even at this conference, where we have speakers from Africa, we have speakers from India, from different parts of Asia, as well as uh, Europe and the US. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vidya. And, and indeed, um, we should give a, a little promotion to the to the Symbiosis International University Conference that's forthcoming. We are cross promoting this in the context of Obriel Global in focus, co-sponsoring the event, helping to support Symbiosis with some of the sessions. So for colleagues attending this webinar today, please do have a look, uh, sign up, um, because it's a, it's a very promising program. Um, I would like now to go to turn to Juma and get his perspectives on this topic from Africa. What does South-South-North collaboration look like in your work and in the African context? Has it gained speed and importance? And uh, how, how, uh, how do you, you see this in terms of its future trajectory? Juma, the floor is yours. You just need to unmute. There you go. Merci beaucoup. Je voudrais d'abord dire que en Afrique il y a une vision commune de tous les pays. I would like to say that in Africa there's a common viewpoint in connection to international cooperation. This is the agenda of the Amer African Association. This agenda, you can take a look at all the cooperation actions in connection to South, South, North. This agenda has been implemented through a series of a, a 10 year strategy. There are strategies that have to do with technology and innovation. There's a strategy that has to do with technical and professional training and about education. That is the topic that matters to us. In this agenda, higher education is considered as one of the priorities, first of all, to train the high-level executives and professionals that are necessary to foster progress, but also to create new knowledge through innovation and research. Thus, there are activities that have been implemented at a continental level and at a regional level. Africa cannot do things alone by its own due to different reasons, historical, etc. But also to apply the other's experiences, it requires a collaboration framework through the development of uh, sustainable development goals. To begin with, regarding South-South co uh, North cooperation, there are many agreements that have been signed with India, for example, as had been mentioned with China, uh, Brazil, Turkey, and other countries and regions in the world. But there's also a dynamic cooperation with the European Union that is renewed through uh, different uh, heads of states and uh, summits. The last summit took place in 2017, and education has played a key role in this summit. 
in connection to with Africa, this cooperation is connected to the harmonization of higher education of um, grades, uh, curricula, mechanisms to uh, guarantee, uh, to assure the equality. These are strategies that are implemented in order to have this process with Africa. It has to do with establishing uh, programs. We have a program coordinated by OBREL, Aqua 1 and 2, and there are other projects that have started that have to do with the development of a continental framework for the for degrees in order to harmonize the higher education in a sub-regional level we have different um, activities being implemented that can be carried out without external cooperation. In terms of harmonization, we have the region in the west of Africa that has ended the harmonization of all the medicine programs and all sciences related to medicine programs. All programs can be uh, compared and are compatible so we also have the states in the east of Africa that have worked on their curricula and created a space for higher education. They have harmonized their curricula and they have their own finding resources. All these experiences support the continental experience, especially the cooperation with the European Union, but also with the German uh, agency. So I would like to say that this is a win-win situation in which everyone wins because in Africa, the capacities that need to be acquired to implement all these programs in terms of implementation, there are some guidelines that are called uh, African Standard Guidelines for Quality Assurance and Accreditation. These are our, uh, quality standards to assure quality. We have the African Agency for Accreditation that has an initiative for implementation, also the African Framework for Quality Assurance, Aqua, and the Pan-African Framework for Grading that has a chapter for development as well. So this is very important within the framework of this cooperation. Of course, there are different challenges that we need to face. I could like to mention, first of all, about the capacities that we need to train. We need to keep on improving these capacities for the South-South cooperation, but also to cooperate with the North, but also in regards to the South House cooperation, there is a deficit of information, lack of information. There are many institutions that should be benefited from the cooperation with India, China, China, Japan, but they are, do not have uh, enough information. So we need to work in order for information to be spread and they can benefit from those opportunities. In connection with the different benefits that may arise from these corporations have to do with the comprehension of the African system in order to implement programs from the European Union. For example, Horizon 2020 and other joint programs postgraduate uh, PhD degrees and uh, all these programs need a good understanding of what is going on at in the African level in terms of credits, in terms of uh, quality assurance to guarantee the implementation of our own programs benefiting from the uh, trustworthy information that may allow the implementation of these programs in a more efficient way. So that is the situation in Africa in connection with the South-South-North cooperation. Thank, thank, you you. So, thank you so much, Juma, for, for giving that very succinct but very comprehensive overview. I mean, basically, you've brought to the floor 
the whole uh, policy field of regional integration in the higher education sector and the extent to that to, the, to, to which that stimulates South-South collaboration um, amongst one of its inherent objectives. Clearly, this agenda has been supported to a large extent by the European Union, as you have mentioned, but in many ways has also taken on its own life, driven by African institutions and also within particular African regions. You mentioned um, some challenges, and I would like to now uh, move to those challenges uh, and also ask some of the other panelists to come in. Uh, you talked about um, amongst other issues, uh, limitations in capacity to take forward certain collaborations, projects, collaborative research, joint programs, mobility. But you also talked about an information deficit. So the fact that there are actually a number of initiatives at play, but that it's very hard uh, to navigate all of these different initiatives and that sometimes many African higher education institutions don't know or aren't aware of some of the opportunities out there in terms of their own South-South uh, collaboration in, in, in the continent. Um, I would like to ask first Peter how, how he sees that from um, his perspective. Uh, Peter referenced in his interventions some examples of very successful research collaboration which has spilled over and had wider effects. Um, but what have some of the challenges been in your work, particularly in facilitating collaborative research uh, within uh, the Latin American re re uh, region amongst peers? And uh, what, how are those challenges overcome or how could they be overcome? Thank you, Elizabeth. Well, let's put some water into the wine. <laughs> um, first of all, I would say if you uh, look at the events, the research projects and publications on our website, you can see that a large part of them have been created in collaboration between cultural practitioners and scholars from Germany, Europe, and Latin America. And a, a very good example, I think, of the strength and the challenges of uh, this kind of South-South-North collaboration is the project Ramon also knows very well, giving focus to the cultural, scientific, and social dimension of EU-CELAC relations, EULAC focus. Uh, in which uh, we have been collaborating between 2016 and 2019. So EOLAC Focus was a bi-regional collaborative project seeking to reinforce a common vision between the European Union and the community of Latin American and Caribbean states, CELAC. During the last decade, as uh, most of you know, uh, relations between the two regions were characterized by the fragmentation of political spaces and institutions, as well as diverse and even diverging interests on both sides of the Atlantic. And in order to regain a joint direction, the project endeavored to identify contributions, potentials, and challenges of the cultural, scientific, and social dimension of bi-regional relation. In this project, 19 institutions, nine from Europe and 10 from Latin America and the Caribbean worked closely together. The consortium encompassed not only universities and non-university research institutions, it also included ministries of research and funding agencies as well as science policy institutions. So, this form of international cooperation between different types of institutions from uh, countries of the South and the North was on the one hand very enriching and at the same time very challenging. Uh, first of all, since it was a, uh, an EU funded project, we had to follow the relevant guidelines, uh, which is not always easy. Uh, this started with the language, even though many project partners normally speak Spanish among themselves and speak Spanish much better than English, the official project communications and all project publications had to be in English. Also, when developing perspectives on content, there was always the challenge of not falling into traditional patterns of thinking uh, uh, for example, you in Latin America as a problem zone and a developing region and Europe as a model. No? So lip service is quickly paid to cooperation at eye level, but in, in, in practical, I think that cooperation, uh, one must always be careful not to fall into post-colonial thought patterns. So living decoloniality is really a daily challenge. No? 
uh, we are currently involved in another international collaborative project which involves partner institutions from various Latin American countries in addition to a number of German universities and research institutions. It is called MESILA, so Maria Sibylla Merian International Center for Advanced Studies in the Humanities and Social Sciences, Conviviality, Inequality in Latin America. So MESILA examines past and present forms of social, political and cultural conviviality in Latin America in the, and the Caribbean. And it employs conviviality as, a, as an analytical concept to describe ways of living together in specific contexts characterized by diversity and inequality. Uh, the center's headquarters have been established in Sao Paulo and the consortium uh, consists of German institutions, but also institutions from Brazil, Argentina, and, and Mexico. The funding comes from the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research. And uh, I can tell you that the challenges are very similar to the EULAC focus context. So it is the question of languages, no? In this uh, case, between English, Portuguese, Spanish. Then the equal collaboration between partners, uh, uh, the orientation towards sometimes rather inflexible bureaucratic requirements of the funder, uh, the effort also to achieve societal impact and at the same time scientific excellence, just to name a few. And perhaps a uh, last um, challenge, uh, I think, is also the issue of open science, because we all are now talking about open access and open science. But uh, this really, uh, many people just uh, still have to learn that open science or open access uh, costs a lot. No? And uh, so I think these are some uh, very important challenges related to uh, South-North South cooperation. Okay, thank you so much, Peter. And I think colleagues um, and, and other panelists will, it, will relate to some of the language challenges, even just within a region like the Middle East or, uh, or within Africa, uh, certainly within Africa. Um, I would like to, to ask Marcella to come in on that. Um, in, Unimed now is running a, a number of projects uh, with its, its uh, partners in the region and its members. Uh, many of them are EU funded projects. Um, what, in your opinion, though, are the greatest challenges and how have some of these challenges been circumvented and, and can you relate to what to what Peter has described? Yeah, thanks, Elizabeth. Yes, we have we are managing several projects, uh, as you said, funded by European Commission, uh, obviously to to work through projects is something obviously interesting because it's the way to do concrete things among us and not just to talk about the importance of our cooperation. We try to, in particular, to work on uh, an important issue like uh, how to reform the governance of our education system in the region, working obviously at national level and not unfortunately at the regional level. Uh, country per country, but also on another topic in very important to us, which is how to support refugees in, uh, in, uh, in our education and so on. Uh, all these activities are surely extremely important, uh, not only for the university in itself, but also to maintain this idea that cooperation, multilateral cooperation in particular in the region is absolutely important to to try to answer to the main obstacles that we have in front of us. Uh, because at the moment we are just discussing about the pandemic, the COVID-19, but before COVID-19 in, in our region, in the Mediterranean region, we were facing several important crises, looking at the Libyan situation, the Syrian situation, Palestine and Israel, Yemen and Lebanon and so on. Um, I think that, as was also expressed by Juma, was is interesting to know that until now, independently by many, many, many years of Euro-Mediterranean cooperation, there is still a, a lack of knowledge about European programs, European vision, European uh, opportunities, and so on. And this is something that we have to always to try to to to, to pass. 
or to try to answer to this. On the other side, I see that the European Commission is financing a lot of projects, but they don't have a clear idea about what they are financing. They just finance, they just uh, control, they check everything, of course, but they don't manage all these projects. They don't try to have a coordination among, among projects. We discussed it with you, with Obreal, about these issues several times. I think that is important. That's also important institution like European Commission, but all the international players also try to invest to understand what they are financing, what institutions are trying to do among them how to contribute to integrate projects or to evitate duplication or to at least to share practice or to, to invite projects to cooperate among them. Because European Commission is looking, and also this is the case of other international institutions, uh, they are looking for impact, which is normal, which is uh, a clear mandate for every funding institution to try to see the impact of the uh, investment in, in, in particular in our region, but I think that generally speaking. Uh, could it be important? It could be important uh, to uh, also to invest a leader to try to uh, invite all these important and relevant initiatives like our networks, university experiences and so on to uh, identify potential issues to work together and also to invest in some particular issues that are working. Because, uh, you know, at the end of the projects, there is the risk that everything disappear and we miss, and we miss the, the, the efforts that we did in two or three years project. This is the first, the first element I would like to underline, inviting in funding institutions to identify other uh, formula or new formula or innovative formula to improve the cooperation in a particular case or, or in addition to invest also in cross-regional cooperation. Yeah. Um, why not to have South-South scheme and not only in the region as, as itself, but also Latin America and the Mediterranean countries to work together. Why not? We have common problems. We could find in looking at South potentiality independently from your, the region, we could work together and to propose to also to European side innovative formula. Uh, this is from one side what I, I, I think that we have to ask to our uh, institutions and why not through our networks of Real and Unimed and the other colleagues, why not to, to find a way to cooperate among us independently by EU projects or uh, funding institutions. We could do something independently by money. We have good ideas, we have good relationship, and we could find a way and to, to work together. Language, as Peter said, is something still until now very sensitive issue. And I think that we have to skip from this uh, Anglophone dimension and to invite also European Commission, I mean European Commission from my perspective, but not only, to consider how to improve cooperation also using other uh, languages and also inviting, looking at my region, uh, Arabic speaking researcher to develop their own research also in Arabic independently by this Anglophone scheme. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much, uh, uh, Marcelo. I want to um, come back to Juma um, and just uh, ask you to reflect on, on two things. First of all, there is a question in the chat uh, directed at you that there is an impression that there are a few uh, African uh, researchers uh, or academics that collaborate in uh, these large South-South-North initiatives and projects, some of, some of which uh, you mentioned, Juma, but that, um, but that in general, there's a massive part of the African academic community that remains outside and what could be a strategy 
for expanding and improving information on the types of opportunities that, that do exist for this type of collaboration. So that's one question to Juma. And then the second um, question I would have for you, Juma, is uh, if you could react a bit on what Peter has mentioned regarding these sort of typical development cooperation constructs where you have the developing region and then you have the model or the developed region uh, and how that tends to be um, you know, copied uh, in all of our collaboration frameworks to some extent, uh, how can we break that? And how do you see that dynamic in, in Africa right now? Do you feel like uh, African associations, uh, African networks, African academics are really uh, able to appropriate the South-South the collaborative agenda for themselves? Or is, it still, is there still a, a tension with, with the, the post-colonial influence? So Juma, the floor is yours. I've, I've given you two, two difficult questions. Sorry for that. Ah, you're on mute. Voilà. J'écoutais attentivement parce qu'il pleuvait beaucoup ici. Alors, je n'entendais pas bien. Mais j'ai compris la question sur... I'm sorry, there's a lot of noise. I was not able to listen, but I understood the question. First of all, you're right, that's true. There are many actions in Africa that occur at the level of the continent but that are available for participation. For example, there are experiences of funding from United Nations for the transfer of knowledge. And these are persons that were uh, coming to Africa to teach from their countries from a couple of days and they come back to their countries. We try to uh, help them. And there was a level of resistance within the continent because they would benefit from certain resources and it caused many problems. All these initiatives have created problems or part of the problems that we have faced. There are some programs that have stopped there are some persons in the diaspora right now that through different papers, or they try to uh, understand, identify those Africans that are experts and who can focus on these strategies. What we are trying to do is for them to participate in virtual activities and in uh, training platforms. These are available and within the framework of um, students and teaching. Maybe they do it during the weekends. This willingness to contribute exists, but we need to identify them correctly in order to achieve a better participation. When it comes to African uh, universities, programs usually work. We have continental alliances and associations, the Association of African Universities, the Higher Education uh, Council for, uh, in, for African countries, and we have associations in the western part of uh, Africa and in the east part of eastern part. But the problem is when we collaborate with countries such as India or Brazil, because contributions are related to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, for example. What we have to do is to work with professors in order to unify the information. It's not that information is not available, but sometimes we are not able to develop that link so that they can benefit from that information. Today, African universities have to identify, first of all, research projects and guarantee uh, that they fit within a national 
curricula uh, or those programs that have to do with the sustainable development goals. And thus we are able to identify the universities in the north when we are seeking joint funding because African universities are not the only ones implementing these programs, but they are seeking funding within certain requirements. And we need to show how that funding contributes to research is related to the national or regional development development uh, program. There is a new approach within Africa to identify those domains of interest and those allies interested in contributing. That is the situation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Juma. We'll actually, we'll come back to a few of your points, um, particularly regarding African collaboration with other regions. Um, Ramon Torrent has a comment, so I would like to invite Ramon to take the floor. Thank you. As I have been very brief in my introduction, I have uh, uh, the, the, the right to speak uh, two or three minutes now. Uh, first, uh, two pieces of information, uh, and then one suggestion. The first piece of information on languages, I'm happy that Peter Birle has again raised this. The, the advantage of Peter is that he talks all the languages, so he has great legitimacy to talk about it, is uh, the following, and this is a fact. A fact, uh, I worked for 10 years in the Council of the European Union, not in the Commission, in the Council. The Council of the European Union is the biggest and best translating machinery in the whole world, much better than the United Nations. The Council legislates and produces documents in around 20 languages. When the European Council meets, the conclusions are immediately, that means the very same night, translated to all official languages. Knowing this, the Council of the European Union meets with its counterparts in Latin America and the Caribbean in the summits U European Union, Latin America and Caribbean. There is a pre-cooked declaration, pre-cooked from a few weeks ago, and be surprised, the only official language of the declaration is English. This is very meaningful. It's very meaningful because it means that if it, if it is only English, the fault is not so much of the Europeans. The fault are in the Latin American side. If only one president of Latin America had said, listen, I want this also in Spanish and Portuguese, the machinery of the council would have produced it without any problem. But it seems that nobody has asked. This is in order to uh, uh, pour some water in the wine, as Peter uh, said. The other story makes you smile. A few days ago, there was a meeting of all the projects of the ACP Innovation Fund, uh, uh, granted by the European Union and the ACP Secretariat. And in this collective meeting, it was opened by someone from the ACP Secretariat speaking in French. And in the chat, I write, uh, as a former director of external relations in the legal service of the EU Council, I'm very happy to see that at least this meeting is held in French. I wrote this in French. I sent this to the chat, the introduction by the chair ended, and then came a civil servant from the European Commission from a Latin country speaking in English, which means that this uh, we have a problem there. There comes the suggestion that will interest much more you. If we are all agreed, and here we have participated in one way or the other, uh, international associations like UNIMED and OBREAL, 
and represented somehow by Vidya, the Association of Indian Universities. And we have the Association of African Universities. And we have ASCUN. And Juma, we have here representative of Andifes, the Association of uh, Public Brazilian uh, Universities. Why don't we convene all together a modest, modest, I underline modest, first session of associations of universities from Asia, Latin America, the non-existent Marcelo Mediterranean region, the Arab Association of Universities, uh, and so on and so forth. Modest, only a couple of hours, like we will have today present each other, to have some sense of shared purpose, to discuss possible agenda of collaboration for the future with an institution that is not an association of universities and cannot be in the convening, but can be in the participating as the OLAC Foundation. We can do this. We announce it, we launch it, we found the right dates at, let's say, the end of June, and we have this going. And where will it, will it lead us? I don't know. To the associations put together to decide the uh, final objective, the rhythm of work. But let's begin by doing, as one of the greatest Spanish poets said, the one who uh, died when retiring from Franco's uh, end of the civil war in Spain, he died in the south of France, Antonio Machado, uh, sung by um, Juan Manuel Serrat, by the way. He said, uh, there is no path. One makes the path while walking. Let's begin to walk. This is a suggestion. But for you, the ones who have to arrive to conclusions today to decide, and the ones who are leading the associations who should take the lead to bring it forward or not. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Ramon. You're already jumping into the last uh, the last block of questions. I think you've already preempted that with your statement, and you've offered one possible path. Your assumption is, of course, that the university associations are are and should be the main actors in this process. I think that is in itself a big statement and one that maybe some people might agree with and or contest. Um, my question to the panelists is, um, and, and building upon what Mar Marcelo already suggested and what, what Juma alluded to, um, many regions in the world have historic colonial ties. Um, a lot of the foreign relations are built around those ties. Uh, at least from the perspective of Europe, we tend to divide up the world. So you have EU Latin America dialogue, you have EU Africa dialogue and, and subsequent uh, cooperation programs attached to that. You have EU Southeast Asia, you have EU India, et cetera. So there's very much a sort of divide and, and conquer, if I might say, uh, approach. Um, but very seldom do we really have multi-regional uh, dialogue and very seldom do we have real multi-regional programs that can support academic cooperation, higher education development, research collaboration. They're very difficult to find. In a way, Obriel Global has uh, set an ambitious goal for itself because our mission does not correspond to the existing funding mechanisms that we see in the world. We hope that will change because Adrian has, as Adrian has outlined, there is a clear need for that if we're going to be really adequately addressing global challenges. So my, my question is, given the need to stimulate more multi-regional transversal collaboration, whether it be between Africa and Latin America or India and Africa uh, and Southeast Asia or the Med and other regions, where do you see the real opportunities now to do that? Um, what types of actors are needed in that process and what, what types of projects and initiatives and subsequently what type of funding? 
And if you know of existing projects, initiatives and funding, by all means share that. But if you have ideas about how that could be better developed, please also share that. So I'll give you each the floor. Maybe Peter, you would like to start. Thanks a lot. Uh, I'm not so sure whether the EU approach really is an approach of divide and conquer. So uh, if, if we take the Latin American example, I, I would say that uh, uh, the European Union would like to have much more um, a much more stronger Latin American partner than there really is. So they have been trying for uh, many years uh, looking for a strong regional partnership in Latin America. The problem is uh, that Latin America has no regional agency. So there are national actors, but the regional institutions are uh, in a deep crisis and there has been a lot of dynamism in regionalism in Latin America during the first 15 years of the century. But uh, today, uh, well, it, it's very difficult to, uh, to find one uh, regional actor uh, who, who really has uh, some kind of agency. So uh, of course there is uh, CEPAL, so, uh, but CEPAL is not a, uh, has no, uh, is not a political actor. Uh, and uh, so uh, if we don't have strong regional agencies and organizations or networks, it is also very difficult to, uh, to think about uh, multi-regional perspectives. So this might be a cooperation between, uh, I don't know, coalitions of interested and willing partners, but not so much uh, between whole regions because uh, of course Europe is not a homogeneous region, Latin America isn't, Africa isn't, so there are no uh, homogeneous regions in the world and perhaps it might be better to, to look for thematic uh, groups and, uh, and coalitions and not so much for a, a multi-regional approach in the sense of uh, cooperation between, between whole regions then we always have the problem of continuity. If you take Brazil, for example, uh, during the Lula government, Brazil has, uh, has shown very strong commitment towards Africa. Uh, there have been a lot of new embassies opened in different African countries, and there have been a lot of initiatives also of uh, inter-regional inter -regional, uh, cooperation between Brazil, Latin America, and Africa. So this today, uh, doesn't exist anymore because uh, the Bolsonaro government has not, uh, hasn't any interest uh, in this type of cooperation. Well, they aren't interested in Latin America either. That's, <laughs> that's another problem, but um, much less in, in, in Africa. So uh, continuity is, a, is an issue. And my last uh, point uh, would be once again, agenda setting. I think uh, that who provides the budget uh, usually has most influence in, uh, on the agenda, uh, on the uh, format of projects and all, all this. And I think that only with a minimum of financial commitment uh, from partners in the South, will it be possible for them to have more influence also on agenda setting uh, and on formats of project. This doesn't mean that everybody has to put the same uh, amount of money, but some financial, I think that without some kind of financial commitment, it is very difficult. We have examples from Latin American countries uh, with regard to the uh, science cooperation with the European Union, very uh, success, success example of countries who put some money and with this really uh, were able to have a much stronger influence in the kind of cooperation that was taking place. Now with the new crisis uh, and the consequence of the pandemic, once again, this has, uh, is very difficult, but I think there must be some financial commitment also from the South. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much, uh, Peter. So two main points there. One is that it's actually more, more complex than just multi-regional collaboration because in many ways, Latin America 
is not a region, at least not from the perspective of having one interlocutor, whether it be on the governance level or, or even on the university association level, might I add. Um, uh, and the second issue is that, I mean, irrespective of the different types of funding that the North could or should on the, put on the table, um, uh, modest funding should at least come from, from the South, either it, whether it be at the governmental level or, or at the institutional level to drive some of these initiatives. Um, Mar Marcelo, do you have any reactions to that? Yeah, uh, first of all, uh, I discovered that it's not only the Mediterranean, which is not a region, we have the similar problem in Latin America. And I think I totally agree with Peter, the fact that also in Mediterranean, we don't have common uh, institution, or, or at least the Southern Mediterranean countries, to be more clear, they don't have common institutions to manage their own uh, cooperation and so on. It's a pity, is uh, the lack of this uh, regional dimension among them is uh, the reason why they prefer to have this bilateral dimension with the EU countries, but on the other side, most of the Southern Mediterranean countries, they also have very good relationship with uh, university in US or in Canada. And it doesn't exist, unfortunately, a formal of triangulation among European university, US universities and Southern Mediterranean and so on. On another note, we see that, uh, for instance, several Tunisian, Moroccan, but also Algerian universities, they are looking for improve the cooperation with African universities, with their own African continent in some way. Also to attract students, which is something that they are copying and past in some way, uh, as, as European university are doing. And, and again, I agree with also the, the idea of Peter that also the South, South government, I don't want to say South America, the South government also has to invest a leader in this international perspective. But I think that if we wait that government are able to manage this, unfortunately, I think that we don't start to work. And trying to answer to, to Ramon invitation, I think that is our role, our responsibility as university networks to, to start to work and to try to open the eyes of our politicians to invite our governments to look to innovative formula of cooperation worldwide. Um, to me, uh, it's very important to discuss about mobility of students first to create a new, this new, we are used to say Mediterranean generation, not Euro Mediterranean, but Mediterranean generation. But this could be obviously uh, worldwide and to, to have a formula, to have mobility, worldwide for our students. And that is, I think that is something that could change totally our perspectives. And another topic for me uh, important is again, academic freedom and the autonomy of uh, how to improve autonomy of universities. Because I think that in particular in, in the South uh, is one of the most important challenges. And again, I think that I totally agree with the invitation and I there with the invitation of Ramon. And I think that if we start some initiative at small scale, eventually, is the only way uh, to invite our government to think differently. Otherwise, we just repeat what we do normally and we know that it's not enough. Okay, thank you so much, Marcella. So yes, um, it is in our hands to take initiatives. Don't wait for the governance and you would put emphasis on mobility, um, uh, but also on uh, academic freedom and, and autonomy. Um, Vidya had to leave us, but I know that she had some additional remarks and Nico has volunteered uh, to make a few interventions on her behalf. So Nico, go ahead. Gracias. Eh, las voy a hacer en castellano y no Thank en you. Uh, I will make them in Spanish and not on behalf of Vidya, but on behalf of my colleagues from India. Two weeks ago, I have the honor of being invited to participate in a session on internationalization of the FICCI. 
It is a federation of chamber of commerce and industry of India. During that panel, I learned a lot on the implementation of the new education policy of India and the effort that India is making to invest some resources or to give some resources to Indian universities to build bridges and projects with traditional partners, uh, Australia, Canada, the United Kingdom and the USA, but also with Africa. And that is not with English speaking Africa. Uh, there are ambassadors from India that are interested in Latin America, that they want to promote the relationships. One of the things that we are trying to do is through Obreal Global, and we want to invite you all to the conference that our Indian colleagues are preparing is to make the will to cooperate visible. I think we have a problem uh, that is mental or structural. It's not only about money. I understand, Peter, that it would be better that South governments promote uh, those collaborations. But we need to get together. And uh, to end, when we talk about these issues, maybe the sector of higher education and research need to look at other sectors or industries. For example, rugby confederations. You know that Argentina participated in European rugby championships, but not in those tournaments organized by Australia or South Africa. And that changed in recent time. And that helped sport cooperation, but also economic cooperation. So I believe there are some governments that are promoting and are, are investing uh, their international policy and their foreign policy, and also to work with other partners. They are opening to non-traditional partners. For example, the conference I was talking about is an example. Uh, there will be South Americans participating. That is something very interesting, at least to get to know each other. And I think that we should maximize uh, that path because we, it's a possibility. And also we need to look at other industries and sectors that could uh, contribute with something and we are not paying attention to them. Okay. Thanks, uh, Nico, also for bringing us outside the education and research sector and into other sectors where South-South-North collaboration is particularly important. Um, we are short on time. I would like to soon conclude. I do need to come back to Juma because he was not yet able to weigh in on the question about cooperate, cooperating cross-regionally, multilaterally, uh, Africa and other parts of the world. In addition, there are two uh, comments, questions in uh, the Q&A that are directed uh, at Juma. So I wanted to uh, refer to those now in case you would like to address them, Juma. Um, one I think is also to some extent referring to an issue that Marcelo may, uh, raised, which is you know, who, who determines the cooperation priorities. Uh, Marcelo made the comment that sometimes the EU is funding lots of things, but we're not really sure why. Um, so who determines the cooperation priorities? And the question with regards to Africa was, has there been a needs assessment done, uh, particularly of the university sector uh, and, and of higher education and research um, uh, that has helped to um, determine the, the funding that is, that is allocated to collaboration in this sector? Um, and, and, and the question refers in particular to the European Union schemes. Um, and then the second issue uh, that is, has been raised in the chat is, is a complex one, but it has to do with the role of student voices in determining this collaboration agenda. Um, are students, are partners, do they have a voice in determining this agenda um, and uh, how potentially could, could, they be, could they be better enabled? 
that's a lot to take on Juma, so you're welcome to address some of it or all of it uh, as you see fit. And then after uh, you finish, I will ask the panelists if they have one last small word to say, and then we'll close. Merci beaucoup. D'abord, la première question, qui détermine l'agenda ou les priorités de la coopération? Eh, moi, moi, je crois que c'est déterminé conjointement, parce que eh, en ce qui concerne that within the European Council and cooperation programs from some years, these programs are defined within leader summits. I remember in 2007, we had a summit that we have and could devour another summit. And this happens at a national level first. Countries uh, put together their experiences in order to uh, determine the issues that they would like to discuss in those summits. Then the experts present this before the ministers and then the ministers attend to the summits and define an agenda that they will discuss uh, at an international level. So that defines a priorities for collaboration between the African Union and the European Union. Regarding uh, higher education, I know that cooperation here um, has to do with what we do every day. When we try to uh, uh, make uh, schedules or programs and agendas uniform, they are all agendas that are at the center of the education uh system and even though we don't have a system we have evaluations and assessments but i think that the agendas that are decided by the heads of states in those summits cover those needs that have been defined by the african countries as regards the voices of the students they are not that much heard they have student bodies, but those bodies are weak. They should receive uh, more funding because that association is in Accra in Ghana, and that association is financed by Ghana's government. We invite them to conferences and summits, but their voice is not sound enough regarding decision making. And with regard to Ramon's proposal to have an interregional cooperation, I think that his proposal is excellent. And we should find a way to uh, make this proposal a reality. Uh, of Ella's professor uh, proposed the creation of a network of higher education and has organized a network that uh, connects Asia, Africa, and Latin America in terms of higher education. We have conferences that are being organized and we have exchange of information and methodology. These are very interesting aspects. And this type of initiatives could be an example of what we can do and how we can learn lessons out of them. And we can see how Afin Africa can, could collaborate with Latin America. And also, as I said before, we should collaborate with Asia, with India, with China, and with Japan. But we need to have MOUs among universities, first at the level of the African Union, but also at the national level. And many times, we don't have this. And we need to find a way to get in touch with the African Union, we have some contact. And after that, we need to see how we achieve this collaboration so that we uh, are able to have these higher education initiatives that are concrete. Now we have cross-continental collaboration and the focus should be on PhD education. We should have more online plans or we, we to have more plans aligned with the SDGs and we should have more resources for this. And we should create new knowledge through research and through PhD. Uh, this is an area that is very important. 
we could benefit one from each other through virtual education platforms and other methodologies. That could be a good starting point for the proposal. We could have a dialogue in order to begin. Can cooperation uh, beyond just the level of meeting between associations to the level of really conceiving collaborative programs together, for example, uh, on issues like doctoral education, when we look at the importance of research capacity develop in the South, development in the South, and I think that's a very valuable suggestion. Um, we are just about out of time. I wanted to offer the floor one last time, very briefly to Peter and Marcelo, if you would like to take the floor one last time to leave us with any final words. You are also free to, uh, to address the question as to what we can do better in Obreal Global to address some of these challenges, to provide a collaborative platform, to take forward certain programs, if you think you have advice for us, because in many ways we are using Obreal Global in focus to uh, inform our own work plan. So, um, but, or you can also just make any general closing remarks that you think really need to be emphasized in the conclusions of this event. So please, less than a minute each, and then we will have to, to end. Uh, Peter. <laughs> Thanks, Elizabeth. Well, famous last words. I, I think <laughs> it's important to take concrete initiatives. Uh, it's better to have small but working initiatives uh, than big plans that only exist on paper. And in this respect, uh, I would uh, really like to, 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 uh, <clears throat> to end here saying that the work of Oreal Global is very important because it is concrete. It brings actors together. It creates dialogues. And so I would like to finish saying uh, thank you very much, not only to, Roman, to Ramon, but also to a whole uh, global, uh, Oreal Global organization uh, because uh, you bring us together and, and this is very important. Thank you. Thanks so much, Peter. Uh, Marcelo, last words? Yeah, thank you very much. First of all, again, or muchísimas gracias for this invitation and for this opportunity. Uh, I agree again with Peter. It's, we don't know each other, but today we agree, I agree with you on several issues. Um, I think that if we are able to start with some, why not, also a small initiative among networks uh, could be uh, also important, but also why not to have some symbolic initiative and open discussion, which is, I agree with Ramon, why not to organize something among us. And uh, looking at this multilateral uh, cooperation, I think that, um, you know, is the, the Africa momentum uh, is still, is always the Latin America momentum for cooperation, but I think that we have to try to involve in this multilateral dimension absolutely the Arab world and not to exclude them from this discussion. They have lots of uh, challenges in front of them, a lot of obstacles, but more we will be able to involve directly the Arab world in this kind of discussion, I think that better will be for for all of us and also to improve our cooperation worldwide and not excluding part of the world. I say this because, you know, uh, time by time there is this problem how to discuss with the, uh, this part of the world that is facing particular, particular issues looking at the, uh, some crisis in the region. I think that we have to pass the crisis and to invite universal people in any case, independent by crisis situation to work with us and to join us in worldwide initiative. This is my last message. And obviously I'm totally at your disposal. And thanks to Obral for giving us this opportunity to discuss about us. Okay, thank you so much, Marcelo. And I should add that, um, you know, Northern Africa at least, and some of the countries of the Arab world are part of continental Africa as well. So we see regions overlapping and agendas overlapping. And I think that your um, plea has been well heard. Uh, we're not just talking about collaboration between some regions, we're talking about collaboration between all re regions uh, if we're ever really going to achieve uh, the goals that we strive to achieve uh, multilaterally and, and, and globally. 
Um, we are out of time. I think we've exhausted um, your patience, uh, dear colleagues. I just would like to thank again the uh, panelists, Peter, uh, Marcelo, Juma, Vidya. I would like to thank again Adrian for his excellent, his excellent initial intervention. Thank you to Ramon and Nico and all of the Obriel Global colleagues who have supported this webinar here today. And thank you to you and the public. This is the point in time where we would be clapping. If we could see you in person, we cannot, but please know that we appreciate you. We will continue tomorrow with Obriel Global in Focus. We have another edition of event that will focus exclusively on Africa. A lot of the initiatives that Juma mentioned will be featured in that event tomorrow. You will have a chance to hear from the European Commission uh, itself, particularly the colleagues working on development, cooperation and education. So please do join us tomorrow. Uh, there is yet a third event this week on Friday on skilling, reskilling and upskilling. Uh, very interesting topical issue for all regions. Check out the Obriel uh, Global in Focus website. If you haven't registered for these events, I think you still can. Um, and the program will continue for the next four weeks. So thank you to everyone. Uh, thank you to the interpreters, finally. And please do join us, do join us for future events. Um, we look forward to meeting you for other discussions. Have a wonderful afternoon, evening, or morning, wherever you are.